so proud of the work that our students have done on their trip and so excited about uh, their accomplishments. The work that they do is uh, such a powerful testimony, uh, not only for uh, the good works that they do, but just the lives that they lead. And I think that that in itself is such a significant piece. You know, we can, we can go through life and we can walk the walk, or we can talk the talk, but can we walk the talk? Does that make sense? Yes. And when we do that, we see a significance that's made. You know, we are in this uh, wonderful series called Unite, and we've been talking about uh, the great importance of the things that are required to unite. We talked about how to unite as one purpose um, as, as a church. We've talked about how to unite as a people. And today we're going to talk about uniting in the way of the means of legacy. And legacy is, is so rich in who we are as a people of faith. Legacy is what really touches us and empowers us and gives us the boost to move forward, but to pass on something that someone else has given to us. And that which we've been given to pass on is something of great value. Well, I remember the first time that I was ever tapped for a leadership position in my church. Uh, Patty and I had uh, been married for only about a year, and we were attending a, a United Methodist Church in Longwood, Florida. And uh, after about a year and a half of attending there, uh, they came and asked me to be a part of something called the Staff Parish Relations Team. Now, every team in the life of the church from an organizational and a leadership point is very important. But the Staff Parish's team's role is significant in that they are the official employer of the local church. But they are also the voice that the bishop and the district superintendent listens to when it comes time to discuss the mission of the church and the gifts and the graces of the clergy with regard to appointments that were there. Well, I hadn't been in that role very long, and I was uh, looking for uh, people who had been in this role for quite a while to pour into me and to give me uh, more knowledge and wisdom of what it meant to serve in a leadership role. And I remember one Sunday when we walked in, uh, we had just gotten inside of the doorway uh, coming into the sanctuary, and there was seated John the Elder about uh, halfway down. Now, John the Elder was a significant pillar in the life of this church. You know, the church has pillars. I'm not talking about the kind we sleep on. I'm talking about leaders, you know. And uh, John the Elder, you know, Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the church, and that's upon which the church is built. And then there's John the Elder. I mean, he's like the second thing. And he was so wise, and he was so connected, and he was so committed and respected as a leader in the church. And when he was waving me down that Sunday, as we walked in, my heart began to to just beat with trepidation. What is it that he's going to pour into me today? He knows I'm a new leader of the church. And I said to Patty, I said, sweetie, go get us a couple of seats. I need to go see John the elder because he's waving for me just as we came in the room. And as I'm walking down, strutting, kind of, you know, getting closer to where he is, he's motioning me to come closer. So I walk a little closer. He motions closer a little bit more. Folks, I was so close, I could smell the applewood bacon on his breath. And I could tell that that morning he also had apple butter with his toast. I was that close. And he said, come a little closer. And I did. And I'm thinking, here's a man of great legacy who's going to pour some wisdom into me, a greenhorn of leadership. And as I bent down, he said, Bob. And I said, yes, sir. He said, Bob, your fly is down. Well, let's hope that what we get in leadership and what people pour into us is more significant than that. But, you know, it, it, what I want to get with here today is a very important significance, and that is that every person in this room has had somebody pour into their life. Every one of us can think about that male or that female or that uh, person that we knew for only a little while or someone we had known for a lifetime who took a vested interest in us and chose to pour into our life. They instilled an empowered wisdom in us. They shared with us some of the great stories of the faith. They wanted to make sure that our witness and our testimony would grow in our knowledge and our life and our love and our walk in Jesus Christ. And the one thing that we share in common with those individuals that have poured into our life is that they were usually older than we. 
They were people that we would look up to. They were people who had maybe been around in a while, been around a while in the life of the church, been around in their walk in faith, but there was something about when they look at, looked at us that they just had something that they wanted to impart, some wisdom, some life-changing advice that would change who we were. When I think back about the people that made the greatest significance in my life, I was thinking about people that, that were of the older generation, uh, folks that were not only mature in the faith, but, but who were a lot older than I was. And every one of them boiled it down to this. Bob, the reason why I'm pouring wisdom and knowledge and love and uh, relationship of Jesus Christ into you is because God's Word commands me to do it. And then they would go on to say, not only does God's Word command me to do it, but because of the joy that's in my heart, I want to do it as often as I can. So I asked, well, where do you find this great wisdom? Where in the Bible does it talk about the older generation giving something to the younger generation? And that leads us to Psalm 78 this morning. Here's what is written in the psalm. It says, listen, dear friends, to God's truth. Bend your ears to what I'm going to tell you. I love this next piece. I'm chewing on the morsel of a proverb. I'll let you in on the sweet old truth, stories that we heard from our fathers, counsel that we learned at our mother's knees. And when I read those words, it takes me back to the dinner table in the Martin house, mostly on Sundays growing up, where mom would always prepare a special meal, and my three brothers and I, and my mom and dad, and every now and then, uh, Big Papa and, and our Nana would come, and we'd sit at the table, and we would just soak up the wisdom. We would soak up the faith. We would soak up just the love and the life that they had to impart on us. The psalmist goes on to say, we're not keeping this to ourselves. We're passing it on to the next generation. God's fame and fortune, the marvelous things that God has done. He, God, has planted a witness in Jacob, sets his word firmly in Israel, then commanded our parents to teach it to their children so that the next generation would know and all the generations to come. And what that says to me is that my responsibility is not merely to, to pour into the generation which is that which comes after me like our children. It doesn't mean even to just pour it into our grandchildren, but it says to all generations. So therefore, it goes outside of what we would say is our family bond, so to speak, but into the family of God, the shared DNA through the blood of Christ, that you and I are called to go outside of the boundaries of our own families, to share and ensure that the next generation and all the generations to come will know about these words. Know the truth and tell the stories so that their children can trust in God. Never forget the works of God, but keep his commands to the letter. Why is it that we do this? Why do we share the love, the life? Why do we impart those words and pearls of wisdom to others so that they will know the truth, the love, and the commands of God? When I think about that, it, it moves us into uh, kind of a, a, an even deeper role. And, and that role is that, that we are to not only empower others with wisdom and impart that on them, but you and I are called to be legacy leavers. That the legacy that someone has poured into us, we are not to keep to ourselves. But we are to take that legacy and joyfully give it away to others as they come into our midst, as what the Bible is calling us to do. This past week at annual conference, I have to tell you, it was, um, it was a real blessed event. Most times at annual conference, that's when, when all the clergy in the Florida annual conference and, and, uh, and, and laity that are elected as delegates of churches, they come together and we usually meet in Lakeland at the Lakeland Center. And usually in the past, it, what usually happens is that, that we sit there and there's a lot of boring reports that we have to listen to. And those reports are usually on things that, that really don't stir the soul or the spirit, but something that someone just wants to let you know about some good thing that they did. And the question usually resides to, but what does this mean for the bigger church? Well, this year was different. 
this year, there was a grander feeling that was there. The Spirit of God was moving even in the heart of United Methodists. And as we were there and our new bishop, Ken Carter, began to unfold this new spirit to say, folks, it's time for us to reignite this spirit of what it meant to be called the people called Methodists. Jim Harnish, who is the lead pastor at Hyde Park United Methodist Church in Tampa, came and reminded us of the tenets of John Wesley's teaching, the one who began the Methodist movement, who said that the power of the Holy Spirit lives in us. And that is to be seen as that of the power of a fire-breathing dragon that lives within each of us. The conference came alive. And we began to hear testimonials, not of reports of things that have happened, but how people's lives had been changed, how God had been seen in their midst. Yvette Carter from St. Paul, the one who is our volunteer leader, who, who runs our open arms ministry across the street, our director there, she was one of just a handful who actually got invited to stand before almost 2,000 people and to share her story. And what she began to share in that story on Saturday morning was was how someone began to come alongside of her. Someone came and began to pour their life into her. Someone began to open her eyes to see that Jesus Christ died for her sins. Her Yvette, who was a sinner. And that that same Christ, who died for her sins, had a new life prepared for her. And Yvette began to claim that new life. And how God has used that experience in her life and rekindling and drawing her closer. And now she is the director of our volunteer ministry to feed families, which last year we fed over 15,000 individuals. And Yvette is now using this opportunity as a legacy lever to pour her heart into the heart of someone else. Well, there was a couple other things that were really nifty about annual conference. And and one of those things is that that sometimes you get to sit right by the right person. And and I got to sit by, even though I work with him every day, I got to sit next to Arch Johnson, our executive director of church administration. And Arch whispered over to me in the midst of this conference, and he said these words. He said, Bob, we sit on the shoulders of those who have come before us. And what he meant by that was because of the foundation, because of the life, because of the work, because of the call of God in their hearts, that the older generation has passed that to the younger generation. And the time has come for us now to pass it on to the next generation. And we began to see some great things that happened there. And we began to see how our eyes and our lives were opened. Well, there's another significant piece that happened this past weekend. And that is that we usually say goodbye, or we do say goodbye every year to retiring clergy. Now, folks, this is is kind of bizarre, but did you know that it takes a vote of yes from active clergy to allow retiring clergy to retire? It actually does. So we had just gone through the formalities of saying yes and allowing our brothers and sisters who have served some up to 40 and 45 years of ministry to to be able to retire. But then comes this very profound moment in the life of our lives as Christians. A retired pastor comes out dressed in vestments and robes, wearing a white stole. This stole represents the yoke of Christ and is a sign of ordination. And it's a white stole, the, the sign of the, the, or the, the symbol of Christ, the purity of Christ. And they go back to 2 Kings chapter 2, and it references those days when the great prophet Elijah was getting ready to be called back into the heavens, and he passes his coat onto Elisha, the one who is younger, who is coming up now to become the prophet of the nations. The retiring clergy member stands up and takes the white stole off of his his shoulders and goes and places it upon a kneeling clergy member who is just now to be ordained into the United Methodist Church and says these words, May all that we were able to do in our generation be celebrated in that which God continues to do from that which we've started. May it be finished in your generation. And the young pastor stands up, or newly ordained pastor stands up, and says, I accept this mantle, this responsibility, to go into the world and to complete that which God has begun in you. 
Folks, that's what it means to be a legacy leaver. That's what it means for us who are older to go and to pour our lives into the younger generation to help them to see the life, the love, the liberties, and all that comes in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because when we really boil it down, here's where it takes us. The people who come after us are the future of the church. And it's a reminder to me, as I know it's a reminder to you, that someone loved me enough And as I said earlier, that person was usually at least two generations older than me that loved me enough to pour into that relationship and to bring me closer into the life of Jesus Christ. A couple of truths that we need to to really act upon as legacy leavers. There's three of them here. The first one is is to, to remind the upcoming generation that there is a first love, and that first love is to be Jesus Christ. That they are to be holy as Christ is holy. And to live into the great commandment, to love the Lord God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love their neighbor as their self. The other piece that we need to let them know is that there is a ministry of the Holy Spirit and that that same Holy Spirit that was poured out upon those first disciples in Acts as we see in the day of Pentecost in the early church is the same Holy Spirit that is alive and well with them today. And it is that same Holy Spirit that is a perpetual reminder of the life, the death, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And the last piece that we want to pour into them also is sharing our faith. Letting them know how a faith in Christ has changed us and how that faith will change them for the future and how that will begin that journey to bring them closer into the eyes of Christ. So this, in all of our services today, we're, we've, we're doing something a little bit different. I'm going to invite uh, Carl Simon to come forward. And Carl's going to come up and uh, we're going to sit over here on these uh, little, little chairs and uh, in each of our services, Pastor BJ did it the, the last sanctuary service. I, I did one at the, um, at the fountain. And um, what we want to do is we want to talk to folks who, who have had significant experiences or, or who feel a fire in their belly to pass on the legacy uh, to, to a new and upcoming generation. And, and Carl is here, and um, Carl and his wife Linda have been a part of St. Paul for many years, and um, they're lovely people. And if you don't know Carl and Linda, I hope that you'll get to know them. They're really jewels of the earth. And uh, Carl, I, I just want to um, maybe ask you this question. Why do you feel it's so important to mentor the next generation? Well, there won't be a church if we don't mentor people. And so it's critically important that we do reach to the younger people. And I just thought this morning, sometimes I get a little discouraged about the younger generation. Mm -hmm. I want to thank these young people for making me feel so good about the coming generation. Good deal. Amen to that. (laughs) So maybe what are, um, what are some examples of of how your mentoring has, um, shape the life of a younger person. Maybe a couple of examples of that. Well, I taught Sunday school uh, way back when I had hair. And uh, I, I did junior high and high school. And uh, I, we did a, a green project before it was right to be green, I think. Oh, okay. But we went out along the highway close by. One of the fathers had a pickup truck and cleaned up the things along the road. And I think that made an impression on that group of young people. One of them did become a United Methodist pastor, as a matter of fact. Very good. And then secondly, kind of a bittersweet uh, time in my life. Uh, I agreed to mentor with the confirmands in the little church we were in in Syracuse, Indiana. And uh, so they paired us off, and uh, there was what many people would call a live wire in that group of children. His name was J.P., and uh, I don't think he ever went to sleep, let alone stop moving. Uh, he was indeed a live wire, and uh, I did uh, the things that I thought I should do to mentor him, and uh, we, uh, we got to where the confirmants had their, their day, and I gave him a Bible. And then the really bittersweet part of that is that many weeks after that, JP was killed riding his scooter. Oh boy. We filled that gymnasium in uh, 
northeast Indiana for that funeral and I think made a lot of lasting effect on not only the young generation, but those of my generation. Wow, that, that, and I didn't know that. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty powerful. And, and what that says to me is because of your willingness to reach out to him. And, and it sounds like that maybe he was um, a kind of personality that maybe folks ran away from, but, but you kind of ran toward him and, and took it on as a, as a challenge. And in getting to know you the way that I have, um, I, I can see why you were attracted to, to say, well, maybe I can make a difference. Well, yeah, some of that's true, but my friend, Pastor Dave Marty, sort of said, you got JP. <laughs> <laughs> so. Carl, I was trying to make it a little bit better for you there, but. <laughs> well, but sometimes we have to kind of be, we have to kind of be said, hey, you need to take this on and do it. So. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and I always take it on with, I think you used the word trepidation already today. Uh, yeah, how am I going to do this? Okay. And... Uh, you just do the best you can. So, so how, how has it changed your life that, um, that you've been actively involved in, in working with the next generation through your generation, so to speak? Well, my walk uh, in real straight line. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I haven't been. But... Uh, I feel like uh, the last few years here at St. Paul mm -hmm. has helped me to walk closer with Jesus every day. Good deal. So, so seeing changes in the lives of, of a younger generation has also allowed you to see some changes in your life. Yep. Great, great. Now, there, there's probably some people that are out here, Carl, that um, uh, maybe aren't going to have their pastor say, you get JP. <laughs> But um, maybe there's some people that are out here today and maybe some that are uh, watching us via live stream that are thinking about, I'm really feeling kind of a pull to uh, be a part of mentoring someone who's younger and um, uh, empowering them in the faith or something. What, what would you say to some folks who might be thinking about doing that? Well, the first thing is don't ignore God's nudges. Uh, my wife has that in her Bible and reminds <laughs> me from time to time. Uh, God will provide. Uh, I do lots of things, including this, wondering, you know, what, what are we going to do? I feel like God provided for me this week, and he'll provide for you when you step out in faith and do some of those things that you haven't done before. He'll fill your cup over. It'll just overflow. Very good. Great, great words of wisdom from somebody who um, is seeing the need to pour his life into the life of others. And Carl, thank you. I know that um, just listening to your story today, uh, I, I'm living into some of those examples and, and just seeing the faces of the young folks that, that you've poured your life into. Uh, St. Paul family, would you thank Carl for coming forward this morning and, uh, and sharing with us? Thank you, Carl. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, my friend. Okay. Those steps are kind of, there you go, okay. You know, thinking about that leads us to really where I want to uh, close with us this morning is, is what is God saying to you? And more importantly, how are you going to respond to that? I love what Carl said in, in, as he opened it up, and, and we had not rehearsed any of the answers. Um, he did have kind of a heads up of what the questions might be, and, but, but I did not know any of his answers. And I love what he said there at the beginning. He said, if we don't leave a legacy in the upcoming generations, there won't be a church. And you know, if you think about that, that's a very true statement. And that's why at St. Paul, it's so important for us to be a multi-generational church, to, to love all people, all generations, but to empower and impart what God is doing in us into the lives of the young men and women and the children who will be the future of our church. You know, Jesus put it quite eloquently when he said this. He said in Matthew 5, 14 and 16, he said, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light be shown before men, that they may see your good deeds 
and praise the Father in heaven. Folks, may the generations to come find us to be faithful. And may we become legacy leavers so that the word, the life, and the love of Christ would be known by all. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful. We are grateful so much today to just celebrate in you what's happening in our lives. Lord, thank you for challenging us, for testing us, for pushing us to strive in an even greater way to be your servants and to be mentors and legacy leavers for all. And Lord, I just pray that uh, as we sit here today, that one thing that might be going through our mind is that we don't have the ability, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the time. But Lord, what I've always found from you is that when it comes to our busy schedules, that if we will say no to the things that are not of kingdom value, it will well and more than open plenty of opportunity to say yes for the things that are. So God, we pray that you would go before us, walk with us, strengthen us, empower us, and may we see and receive all that it is. For you, Lord, we give the glory. Bind us together now in the powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.